Here's a pornography reference. Uh, about my memoirs from my decades in the porn industry. Uh, we rather forget all of that. From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday, which means it's not the square root of 2,914.8. And uh, here we are with our cup of doo-doo and our... Comments, Comments uh, yeah. from, from the, the heaters. heaters. And I, I know a lot of you are just, <clears throat> it's the only reason you're here. You listen to these and then turn the whole damn thing off. And I don't blame you because this is some funny shit. There's no doubt about it. You are what you eat. This explains why Rip is so pink. Would you care to speculate on? Well, no. All right. At least we were spared from having to see Rip wear the crop top. This is when I helped Bree with her wardrobe a couple of weeks ago. She's running out of clothes, so I had to chop a shirt off for her. She's got one of those on right now, doesn't she? You got a normal shirt on now. Yep. It's tucked in. She's got a tucked in shirt on. Rippy. It's like Rippy. She's making fun of me. Is what she's doing. I, I know what she's doing. She's got her little statement, you know. You got to get a wife beater and tuck it in next. Yep. Tuck it in. Make it real tight. Tuck it in. I was at a powerlifting meet a long time ago. Uh, gym owner in Austin showed up. Uh. Had a gym down there. Came, showed up in a pair of dress slacks and dress shoes and a tank top tucked in. It's quite the touch. It just it was amazing. Ah, back in the 80s. You could do that. We sure had a lot of fun back then. You know, Austin was fun. Still fun. It wasn't insane like it is now, you know. There wasn't a loyalty oath <laughs> before you could go into town like there is now. Oh, shit. All right. This pandemic is so dangerous, I don't understand how Rip is still alive. I mean, 100,000 people are dead. How is the fat, old, pink man not one of them? Yeah, you'll have to ask yourself that, won't you? <laughs> Oh, shit. Well, as the saying goes, I'm no proctologist, but I know an asshole when I see one. Now, this was in reference to, uh, oh, me and Kumalatsis talking about, you know, the government fucking us up. You know, <clears throat> I'd uh, I'd rather have Kumalatsis on my side than you, bottom one percenter. <laughs> and, of course, come on, Rip. If you're going to broadcast your views, at least do your due diligence. Seed sales weren't banned in Michigan, and this was established months ago. Rusty? Yeah. Um, Forbes said the exact opposite, and they're pretty reputable, right? I think, you know, of course they're right wing. So. Yeah. 
But, uh, yeah, they said, um, let's see. Michigan bans yeah. many stores from selling seeds, home yes. gardening supplies, and calls them, quote-unquote, not necessary. Yes, yes, we we knew that. Yeah. Uh, Neo Goen, or whatever your fucking name is here. Uh, we knew that, and that's why I said it. Because we knew it was true, and that's why I said it. And you're telling me it's not true is bullshit. Okay. Uh, you're carrying a large grudge and throwing around misogynistic insults over something that isn't even true. Now, how is anything I have said construed as misogynistic? Hold it. What does that even mean? That's where you don't like women? That's right. Right. Isn't that directly contradicted by the I believe he called her first a comment from the hater that we talked about earlier? I believe he called that uh, governor a MILF. I, so, I did call her a MILF. So that must that, be what That's liking. That is liking. Right? I mean, I, I was being charitable, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I did say she was a MILF. Oh, God. So anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, anyway, he said to see the channel being used to parrot debunked right-wing talking points. No. My friend, we invent debunked right-wing talking points. We don't parrot them. We're above the parroting, all right? We create our own. And that's comments, comments uh, uh, from, from uh, the haters. The haters. <laughs> okay. And now since we got comments from the haters, you already know we're doing Q&A today, don't you? We're doing Q&A. So, let's just jump right in, shall we? Hey, Mark, you're a smart guy with a bigger audience than I. How do I know that coronavirus causes illness? With words like asymptomatic carrier and with no meaningful difference in death outcomes between Strict confinement countries like Spain and no confinement countries like Sweden. And given how to date, no study actually confirms this fact that I'm aware of. I struggle to see how coronavirus is actually the key factor in the production of illness. Am I missing something? In my mind, if coronavirus was actually a contagious disease, you would see a case difference between confinement and and no confinement. In my mind, if coronavirus causes illness, it means that people get sick when exposed. But with more than 50% of infected being asymptomatic carriers, seems likely to me that something else is the problem. But people look at me like I'm an idiot when I explain to them that the mainstream news clearly indicates that coronavirus isn't contagious and doesn't cause illness. Well, Jamie, those are interesting questions, aren't they? Very interesting questions. All right. Now, part of the silver lining of the last 90 days has been coming across starting strength, ordering the blue and gray books and committing to getting stronger. I noticed that you mentioned the Deadwood series a few times over the course of the podcast, but not the movie. Wondering if you enjoyed it and how it ranks against your love for some of the best television ever created. For what it's worth, it's shot a few miles from my house, and I worked in a few of the scenes. I would say look for the long-haired, heavy-bearded guy, but that doesn't really narrow it down in Deadwood. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. All of the extras were long-haired, heavy-bearded guys. Uh, best to you and the rest of the starting strength folks. All right. Uh, I saw the movie and uh, enjoyed the movie. I just liked seeing everybody again. I enjoyed the series so much. And the problem with a, a three-season series it there, is that there's just so much character development, so many things that went on, so many things were elaborated. You can't really put a period on the end of the sentence in a two-hour movie. And I think that most of the people that saw it came away with that kind of 
that kind of feeling. I was just glad to get to see the characters again. And, uh, you know, you, you, that, that series was so, it was just a masterpiece in terms of character development. And, uh, you got to know these people and, uh, uh, it was just a, just an amazing exposure to the creative mind of the people that put that series together. David Milch, especially the guy's just a fucking genius. And, uh, I'd have to say I enjoyed the, the movie, but you know, it just, uh, kind of left you with a, is that all there is to it? But really, there wasn't any other way you could have done it, you know. So if you're a big fan of the series, certainly watch the film. Certainly watch the movie. It was uh, it's on HBO. It's still available on HBO. And, uh, I mean, until they get it taken down, uh, you ought to watch it. It's just a, you know, it's a good to see the, good to see the folks at Deadwood again. All right, now a little more serious. Now a little training question or two or three. I think there's a bunch of injury stuff in here today too. All right, hello, Rip. He's from India. Coming to the question, we now clearly know that full range of motion lifts are better for strength and hypertrophy. But some coaches are presenting a case for quarter squats saying it's better for jumping, sprinting, due to the similar joint angles involved. <laughs> We're still not past that. We can't get past the, the similarity between strength training and what you're going to use the strength for in the sport. We, just the ability to think through this is just, it's just a daunting task for some people. So, are quarter squats really beneficial for this purpose? We better off getting generally strong, training the explosiveness, using the Olympic power movements. Uh, all right, look. Why do we squat? Why do we squat? If we're a sprinter, why do we squat? Do we squat to practice our sprints? Why no? We sprint to practice our sprints. We work on our running mechanics when we're sprinting, Right? Why would we try to make our squats look like our sport movement pattern when our sport movement pattern is not a squat? Why would we do that? The only reason we would do that is because we're stupid. We're stupid. Stupid people think like this. Why do you squat? To get stronger. So, if we're squatting to get stronger, how do we squat to get the strongest? How do we use the squat for the most effective exposure to a strength training stress in the gym? And that's a full range of motion squat. Quarter squats don't make you as strong as squats. So don't do quarter squats. And now you're stronger. You got your squat from 225 up to 505. And during that whole period of time of going up 300 pounds or so on your squat, you were sprinting. And guess what? Your stronger legs and hips have been taught to sprint as the strength develops. I, I, you know, the only reason I address this because we've talked about this for 15 years uh, is because it's been a while since it came up, and I just want to remind you, why do we squat? Why do we squat? We squat to get stronger. We sprint to get sprintier. We squat to get stronger, okay? What exercises do you recommend to strengthen a shoulder with three irreparable tears, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis. Uh, I recommend the press because it works everything that's left to work. Uh, if you have three irreparable tears, you can't train them anyway. 
I've got most of the muscle mass torn away from my right shoulder blade. My posterior right shoulder blade's got a hollow spot in it from a rupture of the uh, infraspinatus and probably the teres minor. And uh, I press. You know, I think you ought to bench press too. Press and bench press. There are no particular exercises that suddenly become applicable in the event of an injury. You find the weight you can press, do that weight, and then go up a little bit next time. Just like you always did, okay? I am 72. I deadlifted regularly. Not me, the guy that wrote the letter. I deadlifted regularly for five years and contracted an inguinal hernia, hernia of the groin area, in 2018. My associates tell me that it is easy to develop this injury doing deadlifts. I miss deadlift, but I sure don't miss the injury. Why do some deadlifters get hernias while others don't? And here's another hernia question. Hernia questions get asked a lot. You know, we've dealt with them on the board seven or or eight hundred thousand times. But let's just talk about it, okay? I have a friend who had a mesh repair of a hernia 12 to 15 years ago. I've worked with him on his squat. However, he is very reluctant to do anything resembling a deadlift. The mesh repair is the go-to response for avoiding deadlifts when I bring it up. I've said time and again that considering how active he is and has been, if he hasn't messed it up by now, it's not likely to happen at all. I've also told him that if he makes normal, sensible progression on deadlifts, there's no way at this point Something terrible is going to happen with a repair. What else can I say to him to change his mind? Anything? Uh, All right, let's just do the basic hernia lecture. All right. You do not get hernias from deadlifts, even uh, at the age of 70. You get hernias from your parents. You inherit a defect in the inguinal canal. And it eventually goes. You're fortunate to have gone that long uh, until you're 70 before you had a before you had a hernia. But you didn't get a hernia from deadlifting. You already had a weak inguinal ring, and it finally gave out. I had a hernia surgery back in 2004. All right, uh, I had. Uh, been lifting for obviously decades before that. And I injured my hernia. The first time I remember feeling it was on a split snatch or a split jerk. I was doing a split when I slammed into the split and I felt something. It irritated me for two or three weeks and then went away. And then I finally, uh, messed it up real good climbing a uh, pegboard that I used to have in the gym. So it was, it was hard abdominal contraction that last time that, that jerked it open. And then it was getting worse, and I finally had to have it fixed. So I go in and have a, have a bilateral mesh repair, a bilateral mesh repair. Don't let them fix one side when the other side is just right there. And if you've got a weakness on one side, why not fix the other one at the same time? And with a mesh repair, what generally happens is they go in there and they lay the mesh down and cover the floor of the, of the abdominal cavity with it. And they anchor it with uh, some little plastic anchors. All right. And that, those plastic anchors hold the mesh in place while it's incorporating into the tissue of the floor of the abdominal cavity, okay? And as it was explained to me, uh, the uh, 
the mesh is actually incorporated into that tissue in about 72 hours, uh, meaning that were they to try to go in and pull it out, they couldn't do it. It just grows in and becomes part of the floor of the abdominal cavity. And once that takes place, oh, you're going to feel some things moving around and you're going to have some pain for five or six months as you rehab the thing from time to time. It'll hurt a little bit as it settles into place. But uh, in the 16 years that that have elapsed since I had mine, I have not had many trouble with it at all. I've heard of people having trouble with it. I've heard of mesh uh, correction operations taking place, but I think that the vast majority of people that have this bilateral hernia repair have no trouble with it whatsoever. And uh, it's uh, it's unclear from the first guy, uh, Victor here, who says that he's 72, and he did, uh, it doesn't say he had repair done. Uh, if you haven't had the repair done, go ahead and get it over with. Have the bilateral repair. It's not that big a deal. Uh, they go in, they use a scope now on this, and you're 72, I'm assuming you'd like to continue to be physically active. You're going to be down two or three weeks from this surgery, and then you'll be back to training. Okay. Uh, the reason some deadlifters get hernias while others don't is because some deadlifters have hernias already and some of them don't. And that's all there is to it. The deadlift does not cause hernias. All right. Uh, your associates are wrong. You've heard of that happening, being wrong, right? Even if they're doctors. And here the guy with the mesh repair 12 to 15 years ago. This guy had a mesh repair 12 to 15 years ago. So same as me. That'd be like me saying, I don't want to deadlift. Because 15 years ago, I had a little surgical procedure that I can still lean on as an excuse to not deadlift. What are you going to say to him to change his mind? Nothing. He doesn't want to deadlift. He doesn't have to deadlift if he doesn't want to deadlift. He squats. He's not smart enough to understand that if he squats, he can deadlift. <laughs> he just doesn't like to deadlift. Leave him alone, man. Leave him alone. You can't make him be smarter than he is. You know, you can't grow any balls on the guy. I mean, you just can't do it. It just doesn't happen, right? If I were you, I'd just, you know, just quit training with the guy and just drink beer with him. He'd probably do that. Uh, first, thank you for all you do. I had open heart surgery November 15th, 2020. My wife purchased a squat rack for my birthday. He's 5'4", 150, 44 years old. Little guy. Little bitty dude. Huh? Her. You think that's her? My wife purchased a squat rack for my birthday. I'm 5'4", 150. Why is she still married to the guy? Yeah, she's not little, little bitty guy like he's that. Little huh? dude to his wife. She thinks he's the biggest, strongest dude ever. You think? Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Well, give him the yeah, and he might be like you know, yeah. Yeah. right? That happens occasionally with little dudes, right? Okay, bench is at a hundred, press is at seventy-five, squats at a hundred, deadlifts at one twenty. Should I stay at those weights or should increase the weight slowly? Well, why, Jamie, why would you anticipate me telling you to stay at those weights? <laughs> Is this really a question? You think I'm not going to tell you to take your squat to 105 <laughs> and your deadlift to 125 and maybe make your press go up to 77 and your bench to 102 and a half? You think I won't say that to you? Have you ever watched this podcast before? Have you read our books? Do you not know anything at all? All I know is that you better hang on to your wife.
because she's looking at bigger guys. Unless you're like, maybe you are. I don't know. Don't send me a picture. Send that picture to Bree. Okay. She's not bothered by that at all. She nodded. She said, fine. All right. Well, I'll send it to her. All right. Mark, I've noticed that one of my tendons rolls over the head of my fibula, the bottom of a squat. There's no pain associated with this issue, but I find it unsettling. I've searched the squat, the starting strength forum, found this question has been asked before, to which your response was, have you read the book? That's usually my response because it's all been dealt with in the book. All right. It appears this problem occurs just before parallel, which chops off my squat, only because you let it chop off your squat. I can resolve this issue by using a wider stance or pointing my toes to a more forward position. I was going to say point your toes to a more outward position. These remedies obviously deviate from proper technique. I will admit that I have not had my form evaluated by a coach. Here's the, this is what I would do. I would have my form evaluated by a coach, and I would probably, if that didn't fix it, I would put a wrap on that knee. I'd put a wrap on just that knee. It doesn't take much compression to make that tendon settle down and be stable. I understand it's distracting. I've never had it, but I've trained several people that have had that. I've had one guy one time that would, would squat, and you could hear the tendon rubbing over the top of the fibula. It, it was more sickening to me than it was to him. But we fixed it with a wrap. Just put a wrap on. Just hold it in place. You don't need it tight enough to be supportive. You just need it tight enough to put a little compression on that tendon so that it behaves itself at the bottom of the squat. But probably you need your form looked at. Probably. Uh, here's, a, here's a little secret. All right. Here's a little secret. A lot of times when you have pops in a shoulder or an elbow or a knee, it has been my experience that you can actually make it stop by thinking about tightening it. I heard my shoulder pop. All right, this time I'm just going to squeeze that thing and keep it still. And you can. It's just something you might want to try. But I think you need your form evaluated. And I think you'll find that probably the thing goes away when you get stance and toe angle and knee position with respect to the toes all ironed out. Okay? Rip! He says, spelled correctly with one P. I'm six weeks in to novice LP. So that's a five, adding five pounds a session, progressing just like you say. I've doubled my squat. Excellent progress on the other lifts, too. Eating well, sleeping well, gaining weight. For this, I spent years working hard, doing lots of crap in the gym, and have made more progress in these last six weeks than the previous two years. So I'm pleased. And we hear this all the time, don't we, boys and girls? Yes, we do. Due to personal scheduling, I can no longer keep the same timetable. The only way I can do the same volume each week is to have six shorter sessions on six days. One day off instead of the ideal three longer sessions. How will this affect progress? What can I do to maintain progress? He's in his middle 40s, 5'11", 165. Still needs to gain a bunch of weight. You're in your 40s, you're 5'11", 165, you need to gain a bunch of weight. 5'11", mid-40s, man ought to weigh 200 pounds. And, uh, you know, you just should, right? 200 pounds? Rusty's not 5'11", he doesn't weigh 200 pounds. What do you weigh? weigh 187 and you're... Five seven, five six. Yeah. 
We'll Nick weighs two hundred pounds. Two oh five actually. Two oh five. He weighs two oh five. <laughs> Bree, you weigh two oh five, don't you? You're two oh five, you're five seven, two oh five. Grown man. I'm five eight. 205. 205. 205. No, you're 215. Now. 215, yeah. I've gotten a little. Uh, put on a little mass recently. <laughs> Cultivating mass. I'm getting all bucked up. I'm on a bulk phase. <laughs> I'm doing a bulk. People do cuts. Nobody ever does a bulk. Do they? Is that term gone? Cuts are the bane of my existence as a coach. Cuts. No, every every twenty five year old kid is doing a cut. Bulk and a cut. They're and, doing bulks and too. They're usually cutting. Yeah, they're they're cutting more than they're bulking, yeah. as is obvious no when you see the little happening. nasty little pasty right. white skinny fraternity looking fucks. Or if you're yeah, my client <laughs> Drew, you just cut all the time. Cut all the time. Well, we got to need to have word with him. So, all right, here. So our first observation about this guy is that he needs to eat more. And as far as the timetable goes, if you want to go to a six day on one day off schedule, that's, and that's what you have to do. Then why are you asking me if that's what you have to do? Then that's what you have to do. It's not optimal because it's better to have a complete day of rest between the stress events. It aids in recovery. But if you can't do it any other way, then you can't do it any other way, and you have to do what you can do. All right? We know what optimal is, and you know what optimal is, and we've already told you what optimal is. All right? Here's another one. This is similar. As my weights go up in the LP, it takes longer and longer for me to do the workout. That's true. As a result, I'm either pressed for time in the mornings before work or pressed for time to manage my familial affairs in the evening, what are your thoughts on dividing the LP workout into bench press in the morning and squat deadlift in the evening or some variation thereof? You do what you have to do. You, you know, it's not the best. What The best is what we've already written in the books. You know what the best is. But if you can't do it, you can't do it. So just do what you can do. At least you're still training, Right. Okay. Uh, hey, Rip, excellent video on box squats. I am also in my 60s and using them because of creaky knees. Are you doing anything else prior to your squats to help warm them up a bit? No, I'm not. I just do a few couple of sets of just body weight down to the box. And uh, I do the empty bar for a couple of doubles or triples. Then I go 135 for, I might do three doubles at 135, put my belt on for the last one, go to two and a quarter, and do a single, maybe a double, maybe two singles at two and a quarter, then go to 275, do a single, and then whatever work sets I'm going to do, I'll do those. Uh, I have found that, as I have gotten older, I just can't do a whole bunch of squatting and get recovered from it. I fucked around two or three weeks ago and did a couple of sets across on the uh, on the rack pull, a couple of sets of two sets of five across, and that's probably God. That's been probably four weeks ago, and my back is still irritated. I irritated my SI joint, and it's. You just, I'm telling you, as you get older, you really need to figure out the minimum effective dose of this shit and do no more than that. All right. I know it's popular to try to find the maximum tolerable dose, but you, you can get away with that shit in your 30s. In your 60s, you can't do it. You can't get recovered from it. And you tweak something, it's going to take a long enough time to heal up that it's going to interfere with your training. Do the least you can get away with, the minimum effective dose. It's a common term in medicine, 
and we've used it here at length. I've written an article about it rather recently. I want you to think about how little you can get away with doing, not with how much you can stand. All right? It's, it's, a, it's not useful to think like that when you're uh, a person of age. Nobody said anything. I just coined a new term. A person of age. I just right now thought of it. It's not a new term. It's not? Oh, person of age? A person of uh, POA? (laughs) POA? (laughs) That's not a new term. It's not a new term. A POC, person of color, that's a... That's a perfectly acceptable I term. POA. I haven't heard a PO. I haven't heard of a POA this during this entire chaotic four months we've gone through. You know what about a person of age? Do we have rights and and privileges not accorded to little turds like you and you and you? Huh? <laughs> not if you're white. Not if you're white. You don't. You're just an old white man. Subject to I'm being. Not an old Pushed around, Sorry you know. For you. I, Old white man. That's how you get shot. Yeah. Fuck with old white men. We're not going to fight with you. <laughs> we'll just so paralyze sure. you by shooting you in the spine. <laughs> That's what we'll, we'll paralyze your ass. We're not. I'm not concerned with fighting with you. I'm just concerned with getting the fuck out of there in one piece. And you. <laughs> May be the worst for wear. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, God. You think that's a dandruff? Or just sunburn flaking off? I don't think there's enough hair for dandruff. No, I think you have to have hair to have dandruff, don't you? It's just skin. Just sunburn, skin. Yeah. yeah. Whatever they call it at this point. Whatever that is. Whatever that phase is. Scalp. Yeah. I, that's all summer for me. Just chunks of scalp falling off. Yeah. Well, you know, go outside and mow the yard without a hat on. And the reason I do that is so I can make the skin on my head the same color as the pink. It's, it's working really well. <laughs> it is? Does it look, is it white or brown? Same pink. Same yeah, pink. Same it's pink. uniform. Well, that's the, the, that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So as it turns out that I get, I'm not going to, all right. I tried to think of something to write to be funny to hopefully move. I don't do biceps curls and I want to add grip strength training. My goal is to crush a matured coconut in each hand simultaneously and not have, and not to have a, and to have bitch grip when deadlifting, but mostly crushing nuts. Would at he's right about the English not being the first language. <laughs> Would adding a grip strength training routine at the end of exercise A and B hinder my novice linear progression anyway or slow down progress when entering intermediate progression? Well, yes. As it turns out, if your deadlift goes from two and a quarter to four oh five, your grip got stronger too. Now, if you try to do a whole bunch of grip training stuff, you know, the kind that iron mind sells and all these gimmicky bullshit things that they've got for grippers and all this other shit. You don't need grippers, you need a heavier deadlift. You need five pounds more on the deadlift because what holds on to the the deadlift? Your grip. Right, you need to do a double overhand grip all the way up to your last warm up, and make sure you can double overhand grip up to your last warm up, and then do whatever you need to do, either hook or alternate, or in some cases strap your work sets. But if the last warm up set goes up in weight, then your grip strength is going up too. Right now, let's say you get all industrious and buy a bunch of shit from these people in California. And you start squeezing on things. And you start doing a bunch of heavy barbell curls. Guess what happens to your ability to go up five pounds on the deadlift and still hang onto the bar? I 
made a serious mistake in, but in preparing for a meet one time by doing this very thing. And I'd never had grip problems. I never had any problem holding on to PR deadlifts, ever. I'd pulled 633 in two different meets, weighing 220. I never had any problems. So this one time, I, for some bizarre reason, decided to do a whole bunch of curls the Tuesday before the meet. And guess what happened to the second attempt? <laughs> Couldn't hold on to it. Stupid idea. It was entirely attributed to the extra work I was going to do for my grip. Keep in mind the following fact. If your strength is going up on your squat, your deadlift, your bench, and your press, then your strength is going up. And anything that's involved in the squat, the bench, the deadlift, and the press is getting stronger if the numbers are going up. And this includes your ability to hang on to the deadlift, which means your grip is getting stronger. Nothing else is necessary. I know that you read all of this shit about all this assistance work and all the stuff that you're just not including in your in your training and you're just dying to do some of this fun stuff and buy some of this fun, hideously expensive equipment to, to train the hold in your grip strength. If your deadlift goes from two and a quarter to 405, there's not a hole in your grip strength training. Your deadlift goes from 405 to 605. Your hands are strong. You got strong hands. And doing little squeezy things doesn't make them any stronger. Uh, a, B, it's extremely easy to overtrain your grip. Grip doesn't recover very fast. As it turns out, and I don't know why that is, but it's been my experience and the experience of a whole bunch of people that grip strength training, if you do a whole bunch of grip shit, it takes a while to get it recovered. And if during the process of getting recovered, it adversely affects your deadlift training, then you have fucked something up now, haven't you? So just, just this is not as complicated as everybody else seems to want it to be. All right, just make your deadlift go up and your hands are holding on to a heavier bar and therefore your grip is getting trained, okay? Uh, let's see. And the rest of this is not of any interest. Here's a pornography reference. Uh, about my memoirs from my Decades in the porn industry. Uh, we'd rather forget all of that. Such a horrible time in my life. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Staying on the spinal disc theme. Now, what the hell does that mean? Staying on the spinal disc theme. It's, it's, it's like a follow-up to a... Whenever that one guy asked if your spinal disc... Oh, that's probably what it was from a previous podcast. I'm glad you remembered that because I would not have had the slightest idea. What, all right. Uh, how and when do you reintroduce people, PPL, haven't got time to type out the whole word, that have undergone a discectomy procedure or like surgery back under the bar? Or like surgery. He means similar surgery back under the bar. Oh, you know, back under a light bar, three weeks. Depends on what the procedure was. Depends on if there's prosthesis involved. It just all these things, these injury questions, all are terribly uh, uh, individual. Uh, Ronnie's had a couple of back procedures, and I think both times he's come back uh, within a couple of weeks uh, and gotten back under the bar. You have to go slow. You know, I've had you know, uh, one client, um, John, who had spinal stenosis, had that right, surgery, and he's right. stronger than he's ever been in his life. Right yeah, now. that was Ronnie's first procedure was at stenosis clean out. He's 
I'll eventually have to have that done. I've got some stenosis. Uh, I can feel on occasion. Uh, doesn't bother me right now, but I would imagine within 10 years I'm going to have to have that done too. And both those guys had real good outcomes from that, so when it comes time, I'm not going to. I'm not going to hesitate to have that particular one done. But, I mean, back surgery is a big deal, you know. The numbers on back surgery aren't good. You know, it's about one-third of the time back surgery is successful. In other words, the procedure did what the procedure was supposed to do. About a third of the time, nothing is improved and about a third of the time, it's actually worse after the procedure. In other words, two-thirds of the time, you'd rather have not done it. And this is like back surgery in general. It's In general, it's not a good idea. But if you get to the point where the pain is so bad that you can't do anything, you, you know, some people just... I mean, you just got to punt, you know, got to do something. Okay. Hi, Rip. He enjoys the podcast. He's a 56-year-old male, college basketball player in his youth, 6'4", 220, lifting weights 20 years, fucking around, recently began to train, always sucked at squatting a couple of months ago, made the commitment. To not suck at squatting, progress is being made, but slowly, and I understand that's just the way it is, also bought and been using the programming from the book Barbell Prescription. I have a spinal abnormality, a sixth lumbar vertebra. Now, these things are not that uncommon. Uh, it's an extra chunk of bone, usually a fucked up little thing that's, you know, anatomically not a complete vertebral body down there right above the sacrum sometimes they cause problems sometimes they don't cause problems it's obviously not good original equipment age 15 he said he had suddenly had extreme back pain ended up in the hospital a couple of weeks apparently they found it with an x-ray and now he's you know he had but he hadn't had any problems with his lower back since that time uh, his question is, I'm wondering if this extra vertebra could be the reason I can deadlift 390, but can only squat a weight he's too embarrassed to say. I think most high school girls can squat more than me, currently adding 10 pounds to his squat every week, but he's concerned this mutant vertebra is going to limit squatting progress at some point, or in, end you back up in the hospital. All right. I'd say that a 390 deadlift ought to calm you down quite a bit in terms of getting your squat up. I mean, the deadlift loads the back. The squat loads the back. You know, they're not exactly the same. That's why we do them both, right? But uh, I don't think that you need to be excessively worried about the squat and not the deadlift. Uh, I think that you need to belt everything you do. And I think you need to be cautious and drive the squat on up. Obviously, I don't know that it needs to go to 390, but it certainly needs to be, uh, you know, past the high school girl phase. And I don't see how a 390 deadlift would indicate to you that the squat couldn't at least come up you know, quite a bit. So, okay. Hi, Rip. Your article on curing elbow tendonitis helped me out a lot a couple of months back. I had been trying things like blood flow restriction to promote inflammation as well as avoiding benching, but all I needed in the end was to do chin-ups and get back into it. Well, yeah. Problem is, I've been having trouble with chin-ups lately started developing pain in my finger joints, proximal interphalangeal, this thing right in there, about a month ago after doing some heavy deadlifts. It's a dull pain. There's some stiffness, and I've noticed that using the supine grip on chin-ups or rows makes it worse. 
And if I use a mixed grip on deadlifts, the pain's worse in the supine hand. Mid twenties, lifting seven years. Don't know what the fuck to do. All right. Uh, I, what what is the thing with blood flow restriction and inflammation? Do you know what the hell he's talking about? I mean, blood flow restriction is kind of a a hypertrophy deal, isn't it? Isn't that how that's generally? Sounds stupid to me too. So I don't know what he's been doing with that. And I don't know if what he's done with that is not what's causing the problem in his hands. You would think it I mean, if he, what is he, you tourniquet your wrist and then you try, I don't I've seen, know. I've seen people uh, wrap the shit out of their elbows and knees with a, with like an inner tube. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. But doing something like that would absolutely fuck up, fuck with your hands. I would think it would. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I I have not got enough information here. Uh, dull pain, stiffness. I've I've never had that happen, and I don't have the slightest idea uh, what could cause the supine position to be more of a problem than the prone position. Uh, I'm not recommending that you do a supine grip on your barbell rows anyway. Uh, people that have, have done that with heavy weights have ended up with some shoulder problems as a result of that. That was a bad idea I had previously. And uh, I don't know. I've never, I've never had any, uh, never had anything that would lead me to believe that uh, this would happen as a normal consequence of, of training uh, therefore, I'm going to just wonder what the hell the blood flow restriction shit has done to you. I wonder what, I wonder if you can train your neck muscles with blood flow restriction. Wouldn't that be hanging? That's what they call it, yeah. It's called Hanging. It's the short drop, probably, right? Some people do it for fun, though. Well, yeah, I've heard of that. Can be dangerous. Yeah, David Carradine. As our friend David learned yeah. to his chagrin. My female non-lifter friend has had shoulder pain for months. The doctor said it's shoulder adhesive capsulitis, which is another way to say frozen shoulder, right? So she says she can't move her arms and that it causes fascia. I've never seen it spelled like this to build up in the muscles, which makes it difficult to move. The doctor said it takes 18 months to heal. Well, after all, he is a doctor. I know people who have been in car accidents who don't take 18 months to heal. But your sticky yeah, like me, right? Yeah. Right. Motorcycle wrecks, horse wrecks. Nothing takes 18 months no. to heal. That's stupid. And how does it heal if you're not doing anything anyway? just heals? How does a frozen the shoulder fascia, get better if you don't move the it? The fascia dissolves. The fascia is bunched up <laughs> in the mutches. This is a situation where we're dealing with English, not as a first language. Uh, Doc says it takes 18 months. To, it would, I would imagine doing the press would fix this. Your thoughts? Yeah, it would. <laughs> okay. Hey, Rip, I love the show. I'm 18 and wanted to know if you had any experience with scaphoid fractures. I was training for three months and got somewhat strong, deadlifting 390 for five, squatting 310 for five when I hurt my wrist outside of the gym. Pain was not going away after the layoff. Had surgery in December of last year. On a scaphoid fracture? You had surgery on a scaphoid fracture? Before the surgery, pain stopped me from pressing and squatting. No pain when I'm deadlifting. And it's true for today as well. I'm currently not training. Uh, well, uh, 
I don't know what the hell they did to your wrist. Uh, and unless, you know, you'd care to share that with us, I don't believe that I can answer the question. Uh, I mean, scaphoid fractures typically take about six weeks to heal. And the you you kind of train through that. You have to brace the wrist, give it some support. A lot of people wear a wrist brace at night when they're sleeping to avoid rolling over on it and fucking it up like that. But typically scaphoid fractures take about six weeks to heal, especially in young people like you're 18. Uh, I don't know what you allowed them to do to you, so I'm kind of helpless here. All right, dear Rip, I'm at a crossroads, and I have no idea what to do. Well, that describes my situation, dude. Sometimes. All right, around seven years ago, I started to have some dysfunction in my right leg. Dysfunction. Who's he been talking to? <laughs> Why, we recognize that word, don't we? I was unable to run properly due to knee and hip pain. Walking became uncomfortable, and certain exercises caused pain in my knee. Now he lists some numbers. He's six foot, 230. His squat is 240. His deadlift is 330. His press is 125. And uh, let's see. This is all... Uh, these are all pre-COVID numbers because, of course, we can't train because the deadly COVID-19 virus might get transmitted to someone we know's grandmother, and then her death would be our fault. I went to a physical therapist a few years back, and it seemed to help. However, the issue is worse on my right side. I just watched your message. Is physical therapy fraud? I agree with your stance and was beginning to notice issues with their approach during my 2020 return to the PT office. Spent $500 this year in visits and still have issues. Issues knee pain, hip, psoas, discomfort. Psoas, they know that, of course. And a seemingly significant misalignment on the right side of my lower body. Can you help me figure out how to fix this problem? All right, then he gives me all of these issues. All right, look, what's wrong with you? Has anybody not told you what the problem is? How much money have you spent with these fucking morons to have no diagnosis? That's exactly right. They haven't told they, him. They haven't told him. A, he doesn't have the slightest idea what his problem is. Eddie, he just knows he can't walk. Yep. <laughs> and he might never find out. And he'll never find out if he keeps allowing them to not tell him. Look, if, if you go to medical professionals, right, and you pay them a whole bunch of money and they don't tell you what the problem is, perhaps you should stop paying them money. Because if you don't know what the problem is, how are you going to know how to fix it? We don't just approach things with this bizarre shotgun approach, you know, put hot wax on your hand and then massage you on the back of the neck and then ice your knee and then, you know, do bands, you know, and wiggle your toes around and shit like that and end up with a great big physical therapy bill in the absence of a diagnosis of what it is they're trying to fix. Uh, Ryan. You're a fool. You're being played. All right? If the plumber comes to your house, you've got water in your floor. The plumber comes to your house. And he doesn't tell you what's leaking. <laughs> Are you going to have him back to the house next week? <laughs> Right? I mean, we we have to find out what's wrong before we can fix it, or don't we? Like, 
you, the plumber comes over, you've got water all over your floor, and he proceeds to install low flow shower heads on all your. Right. He puts low flow shower heads in all the bathrooms that aren't leaking. Yeah, and then leaks. Right, and then leaks. And you go, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and he drives away. Yeah. That's the way it goes. And he says, on the way down the street, he says, see you Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> ah, man, I don't know. Uh, you, my friend, have got some problems here. And you have paid people to help you with these problems, and they haven't done it. Well, you hadn't paid me. So there you went, okay? I don't know. That sounds awfully mercenary. I don't know. I do a lot of free shit for people, right? Yeah. Don't you think? Yep. I mean, if you'll come by, I'll be glad to look at you. No charge. I'm not a medical professional, so I can't, I can't charge you for my opinions, which are probably worth quite a bit more than the people you've been seeing. Okay. Uh. Hey, Rip, have nerve damage in my left shoulder, consequence of being a giant newborn. So this is a this is a an injury that was required that was acquired during birth, I suppose. Oh. Like a forcep injury or something like that. They mashed things. It's amazing how dangerous childbirth can be when there's a doctor involved in it. Right? Limits the range of motion. In my left arm. I can't press overhead or get into the front rack position for cleans. I've been following protocol, but I've been substituting weighted dips in place of overhead press and barbell rows instead of cleans. I know it isn't optimal, but it's the cards I've been dealt. It's time to come up, uh, best I've come up with in terms of being able to follow any of your progression. Okay. You don't need to row instead of clean. If you can't clean, you don't clean. But you don't have to row instead of clean. If you want to row, that's fine. But you don't have to row, right? And if you cannot, for anatomical reasons, get into an overhead press position, then you can't do overhead presses, okay? One thing you failed to mention here is if you can chin. I'd be interested to know if you could chin. I think if you can chin, then you'd apply force in that plane. And I think that maybe there's a way with professional help such as mine <laughs> that you might be able to eventually press. But, you know, these injury things, I'm telling you, these things are highly individual and you kind of got to be here, you know. All right. Hey, Rip, I was hoping you'd elaborate on training with spondylosis and or spondylolisthesis. <laughs> I'm 44-year-old male, 250. I was diagnosed with spondylosis about six years ago. My doctor told me then never to deadlift, squat, or pick anything up over my head. <laughs> Oh, shit. Oh, this is... <laughs> These questions so thoroughly reinforce my opinion about this thing. Oh, God. All right, let's see. Started drink, starting strength program at home two months ago. He's got 310 for three sets of five on the squat, 350 on my deadlift, despite the fact that the doctor said to never do it. All right, the first sentence is the problem. All right, he says, I was hoping you would elaborate on training with spondylosis or spondylolisthesis. Now, these are two completely different things. Basically, spondylosis means your back hurts, okay? You've got some inflammatory process in your back. It could mean generalized back pain. Sometimes it's used like that. It might mean 
pre-arthritis, bony osteoarthritis, generalized inflammation of a portion of your spine. Spondylolisthesis is a very, very specific anatomical defect in the lumbar spine. It involves the displacement forward of the vertebral body segment uh, relative to the one below it. And it is a potentially very serious injury, but... The thing is graded from one to five. Uh, what what a spondylolisthesis is is a separation of the vertebral body, the fat part of the vertebral segment that you are familiar with, uh, from the structures posterior to it, the pars segments and all the overlapping lamina and all that other shit back there. Uh, a lot of times this is, uh, most of the time, this is a congenital defect. The, the thing didn't form correctly, and now it's a, it, it becomes a problem. Sometimes these things are not a problem, and they're diagnosed on normal x-rays without any displacement of the vertebral body at all relative to the one below it, and that's grade one. A grade five is a full displacement. Now, uh my friend Ellen Stein, who's probably the strongest female masters lifter in the world, is deadlifting at the age of 67. She's deadlifting over 400 at 132 with a grade 3 spondylolisthesis. So I guess strength is important here. You know, if I've got a loose segment like that, I think I want to be as strong as I can stay. Keep it stable. Strong is stable, right? But you're throwing the word spondylolisthesis in here and then don't speak about it again. Uh, your doctor told you never to deadlift. Now you're deadlifting 350 for three sets of five on your deadlift. I don't recommend sets across on the deadlift, so you hadn't read my program. But it seems to me like you just proved your doctor wrong. Rip, I'm in my early 40s, having difficulties with my wrists and thumb joints. Oh, and good God, he went to the orthopedic doctor for evaluation, told that x-rays showed early onset arthritis in his thumbs. No signs of wrist issues. Carpal tunnel syndrome is not present, said symptoms look consistent for someone who aggressively uses their hands. Well, some of us aggressively use our hands. That happens. Some more than others. Some more than others. Some more than others. Some of us, you know, or sell insurance, and then some of us fix fences, right? Uh, he says he's spent a lot of time as a musician, a carpenter, mechanic, and... Stress of stresses a computer operator. Why would you think computer operation is hard on your hands? I guess moving your fingers a bunch. What else are you going to do with your fingers? It's the way that <laughs> Not move them? <laughs> karate chop everything that you type with a karate chop? How do you do that? <clears throat> Do people who deadlift get carpal tunnel? Do you know anybody with carpal tunnel? The only people that deadlift that get carpal tunnel are also using growth hormone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I've never actually heard of carpal tunnel on a deadlifter. Yeah. It's not a common thing. You know? Uh, not only has the... He, but he says he doesn't have any carpal tunnel. He's just... He's got arthritis in his... Oh, arthritis. In his... In his Fingers and thumbs. Uh, I'd like to know if for sure you have osteoarthritis and not rheumatoid, because some of these symptoms overlap. I would, I would uh, check for that, because if you've got rheumatoid arthritis, you've got a different situation. Uh, uh, grip strength lessen, pain in the wrist becomes so bad. Flexion hurts, but it's not. Numbness, like carpal tunnel, apparently. Uh, limiting 
uh, his ability to perform barbell lifts at appropriate weight loads. I don't know, Steve, what other shit you're doing in your training. I don't know what else you're doing outside your training that's irritating your, your hands. Uh, but if you are squatting correctly with a correct grip, deadlifting with a correct grip, pressing and benching with a correct grip, there's not really any wrist movement in any of the, uh, any of that movement pattern stuff we use for those three basic, those four basic lifts. Now the clean can aggravate a wrist. Cleans can aggravate your wrists. Uh, you can get a scaphoid fracture easily doing a clean. If you're doing squat cleans and slam your elbow into your knee happens all the time. Uh, I would, uh, you know, not knowing anything more about what you're doing. Have you had, uh, uh, somebody that's good, uh, at reading wrist x-rays, look at your wrist. It may be that you have a scaphoid fracture. Uh, we talked about that earlier in the podcast. Uh, I'd like to know how it happened, but I don't, again, this is one of these things where it's an injury thing. The details are terribly important and I don't have enough detail. So that's just, sorry. Okay. Uh, this one, now, look. Jesus. This is not what How many times? we want. Don't do this for the podcast. This is sent to Starting Strength Radio. All right? Um, I, I don't need, uh, this, is a, this is a personal training consultation. All right? This is not a. Uh, oh, God. Uh, look, it's the last thing we oh, there you go. See, that's, that's how it's done. This is what we want to see. That's how it's done. Dearest Rip. Hey, there we go. That's sweet. Already. Sweet. I'm in a better frame of mind. Just wait till the next sentence. <laughs> next sentence. I have a wrist problem. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hey, who doesn't, you know, <laughs> what 19 year old kid doesn't have a wrist problem, <laughs> usually on the right hand. <laughs> Whenever I do that's underweight, a, that's a masturbation joke. wrist pronation, <laughs> flexion, extension, rotation, I get this feeling of bones Sliding against one another. Man, he goes there, crazy with it. <laughs> there is no pain, but the feeling is extremely uncomfortable. Well, now that's uncomfortable is not what we normally associate with excessive masturbation. Up and down. But, Just quit doing the what, circle things. <laughs> what can I do about this? I'm 19 years old. Thanks. Oh, this is really a risk question. Jesus. He doesn't like the way his bones slide around. <laughs> Fuck, man, I don't know. <laughs> you say it doesn't hurt? Wear a wrist wrap. Do you know how many people's wrists hurt? We got to do something about that. Your wrist, I'm not concerned with because hey, it doesn't hurt. And just, you're 19, and God almighty. We need a starting straight wrist wrap with all these wrist problems. That's not a bad idea. They'd sell, wouldn't they? They'd sell. Hold it. All the 19 year olds. Get that off of there. Uh, fix all the wrist problems. <laughs> and then they get elbow tendonitis. Goes all the way up. And then the shoulders <laughs> are going to. Then, then the shoulders. Tendonitis. You get bicep tendonitis. And then the, exter the <laughs> external rotators get all sore and shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we beat that one wow. to death, didn't we? <laughs> That's about all we can do with that topic. Okay. Thanks for being here. So much fun. Hey. So what? Where'd you, get, where'd you get your cool shirt? My cool shirt? Phoenix. The ammo guys, man. These guys gave me this shirt. Looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Is it tucked in? Yes. It's tucked in. 
You don't like that? Bree likes it. Bree's tucking her shirts in these days. I think people that don't tuck their shirts in are slobs myself. You're slobs. slobs. You're just slobs. Me and Bree are. I mean, good grooming is important. Wouldn't you say, Bree? Yeah. Russ, you told me you showered yesterday. No, I washed my hair. Oh, you washed your hair. You washed your hair and didn't shower? No, no, I showered. In the sink? No, no. The, the, you wash your hair in the sink? Do people still do that? No, I showered, but I washed my hair when I showered. You don't normally wash your hair when you shower? Well, you're a lazy pile of shit, aren't you? What, what, what does it take? 30 seconds? Put the soap, you know. Rinse it off. Right? The natural oils are good for your hair. Well, Rusty, I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but your head is pretty greasy. I don't think... Your natural oils are being oils. underproduced. <laughs> All right. You could tolerate every other day. It, yeah, you probably break down and wash your head yeah, when you're in the in the shower. You know, and you might find you might find that people you know treat you better. <laughs> I don't want people to treat you better. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do, Rusty. You want to be treated better. <laughs> Just try, yeah. Try see what happens. Try it a week. See if you don't. See if you don't like it. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you next Friday. <laughs> <laughs>